Okay, congratulations, you've made it to the third and final module of this week's pre-lab. We've been talking about how we're going to use various data points to identify unknown organic molecules. Okay. So the last of the methods of characterization is known as mass spectrometry. And as the name implies, you're going to use the mass of the molecule um, to help confirm its identity. Seems very logical, right? So to recap, we have discussed the solubility tests and the use of infrared spectroscopy to think about the functional groups present in our molecule. For instance, in this uh, mock IR spectrum, I'm zoning right in at this very strong absorption signal around 1700, which probably tells me I have some sort of CO pi bond in my molecule and lets me focus in on the functional groups that contain that, that unit, okay? We also discussed the fact that we can narrow down a list of possible molecules uh, based on the number of unique carbons we have. So I can count up the number of signals in my C13 spectrum and say, okay, I'm looking at a molecule that has seven different types of carbon. Now, when I look at the structures in my list of possibility, I can scratch, scratch out anybody who doesn't meet that unique number of carbons. The last piece of data is going to be a mass spectrum. And that data is going to look very similar to this picture here, okay? And we're gonna talk about how to interpret this and how to use um, all of the specific information embedded within this spectra to confirm the final identity of your molecule. Okay, so why do we need um, to confirm the mass of the unknown? Let's consider a scenario um, where I'm debating whether or not my structure is molecule A or molecule B, okay? Um, let's count the unique type of carbon in each of these ketone molecules, okay? So these are both ketones. So by infrared, they'll be very similar. I'll see that diagnostic 1650 to 1750 absorption signal, okay? So that's gonna be my IR data. By number of unique types of carbon, in molecule A, I have the carbon to the left of the carbonyl, it's a CH3 group. Then I have the carbon of the CO pi bond itself. Its neighbor, number three, is different from carbon four, which has these two methyl groups on it. What we do know is that each of the methyl groups is really considered the same. So we have five types of carbon, most of them being sp3ch bonds, and one of them being a CO pi bond. In molecule B, I have again a methyl group directly attached to a carbonyl, I'll call that one star. And this one again, the carbonyl itself is two. The one next door is three. Well, in this case now, I encounter another CH group, but it's different than the one that sits right next to the CO pi bond. It's got different neighbors, so we give it a different number. And then I have a methyl group at the end here. Even though this is a CH3 and carbon one is a CH3, again, when I look at who they live next door to, they don't have the same neighbor. Number one is directly next to the CO pi bond, whereas this one that we'll call number five is directly next to the CH2, okay? So they both have five unique types of carbon. So if I'm just looking at their mass spectrum and their C13 and their solubility data, um, it could be really hard to distinguish these two possibilities from my list. This is where mass is gonna become important. If I look at molecule A, it has one, two, three, four, five, six 
total carbons. Whereas molecule B, one, two, three, four, five, has only five total carbons, okay? Their mass is different. So in some ways, you're probably thinking, hey, this seems like the easiest piece of data to analyze. I think about how much the molecule should weigh per mole, and um, I can distinguish them if I have a way to observe that mass. Okay, so the way that mass spectrometry data is collected is you have your sample and you typically will vaporize it into the gas phase, okay? And um, you will expose it to an electron beam, okay? In the presence of this high energy electron beam, it becomes very easy um, to ionize the molecule, okay? This ionization can be very simple. It can simply come from the loss of an electron, okay? So this is a little different than when we talk about forming ions through something as dramatic as an acid-base reaction where the structure really changes. Um, this is really a small change. We're losing an electron, and by doing so, we're imparting a positive charge onto the molecule, okay? At this point, the molecule encounters these negatively charged accelerating and focusing plates. They're sort of meant to direct any of the molecules that have undergone ionization towards a detector, while a vacuum pump allows any of these neutral gas phase molecules um, to be removed from the system. Okay, so as we approach our detector, we have only molecules that have lost an electron or somehow gained a positive charge. And the detector is able to very carefully um, calculate the mass associated with this charged molecule. And it comes to a recorder that then um, goes on to our computer. Okay. So that is the uh, five second version of mass spectrometry. It's actually really interesting. And if you have more interest in the physics of these um, instruments, you could certainly learn more about that. Okay. So let's consider what the output is going to be for our mass data um, for our given carbon containing molecules. If you were to look on the periodic table at carbon, Okay, um, what is the mass that you find on the periodic table? Um, we tend to rattle off 12 very quickly. Um, but when you look on the periodic table, the mass of carbon is not listed as exactly 12. Okay. Um, if I am so lucky as to find myself with a mole of diamond and I put it on a balance, that mole of carbon um, will not weigh exactly 12.0000. So why is that? Okay. Um, it is because we can have different isotopes of carbon. And that is something that is given to us by nature. Okay. So for the carbon atom, uh, what we tend to find is that 98.89, so pretty much almost 99% of carbon atoms are the C12 isotope, okay? Six protons, six neutrons. 1% of carbon is C13. And what that means is we have an extra neutron, that particular carbon atom is going to have a heavier mass, okay? Um, what we see on the periodic table is a reflection of this natural abundance. Um, the way that I like to think about this is if I have a hundred carbon molecules in my sample, 99 of them will be C12 and one will be C13 and that's going to make the mass of my sample just a little bit heavier. Okay. Why is this important when we look at mass spectrometry data? It's important because as your charged molecule comes to the detector, 
we are recording the mass for every single individual molecule. Okay. So this is not a case where I take 100 and I put them on a balance and I see a weighted average. This is a case where as every individual M plus charged molecule makes its way to the mass detector, I will observe the exact mass of that ion, okay? And so for some of the ions, I might see C12. For other ions, I might observe C13. And we just wanna be aware of this so that we can account for the complexities we're gonna see in our data, okay? Um, so of the isotopic um, abundances that are reflected within the periodic table, I'm gonna highlight the ones that we're actually going to observe in our mass data and that thus we're gonna care about. Carbon, okay, so we are gonna see this 1% abundance of C13. You'll notice that when we get to hydrogen and nitrogen, that percentage drops below 1%, the same for the isotopes of oxygen. So we can really not expect to see that significantly within the mass data. This 1% is kind of gonna be our cutoff for really being able to look for the minor isotope. So as you come down the list, there's two that are really, really important. Um, chlorine and bromine have a very high percentage of their less abundant isotope. So 75% of molecules of chlorine will be Cl35, but 25% will be the heavier isotope Cl37. For bromine, it's almost a one-to-one -one mixture of Br79 and the Br81. So for both of these, we have some more abundant isotope, we'll call that mass M. So M equals Cl35. And then we have M plus two, which is the Cl37. Okay. And we're gonna take a look in the next few slides about how we can expect to see this in our mass data from a sample of molecules that contain chlorine atoms and bromine atoms. Okay, let's start with a simple case. Follow along with me at home on this one. Consider the molecule ethane, okay? And think about what we might expect to see as the mass of ethane from a mass detector, okay? So now you're probably saying, well, you told me about the C12 and the C13. Which one do I use? Here's our rule for mass spectrometry. We're always going to start by calculating the exact mass of one molecule of ethane using the most abundant isotope at each atom. Okay? So for ethane, that would be a C12 a C12, and again, for hydrogen, we're always just going to account for the mass as one because its minor isotope is insignificant, okay? So what we should expect here is 12 and 12 is 24, and six for my six H's gives me a mass of 30, okay? 30 mass units. And I'm just going to place a signal on my spectrum here. Okay. Excellent. Um, I'm actually going to erase the label at the top because it's redundant. There we go. Okay. Excellent. So now we can start to think about how can we expect to see carbon 13 um, in this structure. And so let's consider this situation where we incorporate one C13 into the molecule. 
now the mass would be a total of 31 mass units, okay? So on my mass spectrum, I will expect to see a signal there because I do expect that I'm going to see a natural reflection of the C13 abundance, okay? Now think back to the table and the percentages listed within that table. There is 1% of molecules that tend to have the C13 isotope. And so I do not expect the height of that to be as large, okay? So I expect this peak to have a smaller intensity. Sometimes at this point, students will ask, well, what about 32? Could I have the scenario where I have a C13 on each of the two carbons? When you look at the probability of that, um, it actually becomes quite small. You only have a 1% um, likelihood of incorporation of C13 at each individual carbon. Um, so when you consider the probability of a molecule having two C13s adjacent to each other, that is much less. So we tend to see um, the incorporation of one C13 into the molecule. And we see that as what we call um, the M plus one. So this molecule here, ethane, tends to be reported by this signature in the mass spec. Okay. So when you see this extra peak, it's coming from the incorporation of the less abundant C13 isotope. Okay. Let's try another one. Um, this one is particularly interesting. Let's try bromobenzene, okay? So again, you're going to follow our mass spec rules, which is to define the first signal that you would expect to see. You're going to take every atom and you're going to use the mass of its most abundant isotope. So again, our carbons will all be C12. And then we have five hydrogens. So we have 12 times six for 72. We have five times one because we have five hydrogen. And for bromine, if we look back at our table, there is a slightly greater abundance of BR79. And we have one of those bromine, okay? So let me pull out my calculator because my math brain is not working this morning. And I should get a mass total of 156. And I place that, apologies. <laughs> I place that, that's when your technology is a little too well integrated. Um, I place that onto my axis here. Okay. When I think about what other signals I might see as part of the signature for this molecule, I'm gonna do the same I did before, and I'm going to consider um, the possibility of seeing some of the less abundant isotopes. Remember, when we looked at bromine, um, BR79 was about 51% of what you would find in a sample of a molecule containing bromine. But 49% of the bromine atoms are likely to be BR81. And so because that is a highly abundant isotope, we're gonna keep all of our carbons at 12 and we're gonna recalculate the mass, okay, using 81 and we'll see a mass of 158, okay? So if we call this M plus, we'll call this one M plus two, okay? And because this bromine 81 is highly abundant, we'll see a signal that's almost equal in intensity, maybe slightly shorter to the 156 itself, okay? We say that both of these are associated with the molecule. They're part of its mass signature. 
we call the slightly higher one the molecular ion okay, or the parent ion. That is calculated using the most abundant isotope at each atom. Okay. And this represents the intact molecule most abundant at each atom. Okay. And of course, we could keep going. Now we could think about, well, what about the C13 incorporation here? Um, so let me use my BR79. There is a possibility, if I wanted to think about really what this signal is likely to look like, I could have BR79, but I have the potential to have C13 incorporation within to my ring, okay? If I have 113, my mass will be 157, okay? So I would expect a signal right in between the 156 and the 158. When we think about how tall that signal is, it should be much shorter than the 156 or the 158 because C13 is only a 1% abundance when we consider the carbon atom. One thing I want you to consider versus the ethane example, and this is a really kind of finer point, um, it'll become more important as you start to work with larger molecules as unknowns like in Chem212, um, but it is worth noting when I have six carbons in my molecule, there is a 1% incorporation of C13 at each carbon. And so I see the height of this signal as about 6% of the height of the signal calculated from just C12. Okay, and of course, you wouldn't be surprised to find that some of the molecules containing BR81 will also have a C13 incorporation. Okay, so these should be shorter. And um, this is all part of that mass signature. So it can look a little confusing if you're thinking the way we typically do, which is using a molecular weight, you would expect one number. Um, the mass detector sees every molecule as an individual. And so it will pick up on any isotopic variations present. So we tend to see more of a signature that has complexity associated with the molecules. Okay, so let me show you um, an example with chlorine and it should make sense. You can sort of think about the way we just described bromobenzene. This is benzyl chloride. And this is a representative mass spectrum, okay? So again, on the x-axis, we have the number reflecting the mass over charge. And the y-axis here, you can really just think of as counts. Um, it's reflective of the number of molecules that showed that mass, okay? So again, here is our M plus, right? Our molecular ion here you're seeing the um, 126, okay? This came from a Cl35 and a carbon 12 at each of the individual carbons, okay? So you could validate that 126, practice your math. No surprise, what we see is also a signal at 128, reflective of the chlorine 37 isotope. And remember we said that these are present in about a 75% to 25% ratio. Okay, so by height, you're looking at about a three to one height difference. And then there's our little baby signal in here. And that is the case where we start to see a C13 incorporated into the molecule, okay? So these signals as a whole, the pink and the blue, are telling us that we have a molecule that contains a chlorine atom. So for instance, if you're looking through, let's say you think you have a carboxylic acid, 
and your IR looks good, and now you're looking at the mass. And you see this type of signature where you have, whoa, a 126 and then a 128. Um, you probably want to look through the list and say, hey, do any of these possibilities have a chlorine? Um, because my data is looking like I have this signal and a mass that's too higher in a three to one ratio. And that tells me that I've got a chlorine atom. Okay, so um, let's look at some of the other nuances within the data. You might be saying, okay, I buy everything you told us up until this point. I get the pink, I get the blue. What's going on down here? Okay, why am I seeing all of these other smaller numbers? Is that contamination? Do these somehow come from the molecule that I'm working with? What's going on? So if we take a look at this, um, what tends to happen in the mass spec is I've told you that you vaporize your molecule into the gas phase. And then you say manage to, you know, knock an electron off of the molecule and you create a positively charged species, okay? Um, this positive ion is no longer as the original molecule. Well, as it travels the path to the detector, it is continually um, in this high energy environment. Um, we're in the gas phase, so you can imagine that molecules are colliding with one another. And given this instability, it's very often observed that the molecule begins to fragment or fall apart. Okay. The way that I usually describe this is um, you could think of the high energy environment of the mass spec. Um, if I take a baseball and gently throw it towards my glass window, maybe the window won't shatter, but I'll start to get a crack. That, that crack represents the first ionization, okay? Where the molecule is still intact, but I begin to knock my electrons off, it's losing stability. The longer it remains in the mass spec environment, being um, you know bumping into other gaseous particles, what happens is it's like I take the ball and I throw it again. Well, now that there's a crack there, the glass begins to shatter into tiny pieces. Okay, these numbers here, those are the tiny pieces. They represent fragments of the molecule that have started to be observed by the mass detector as the molecule falls apart, okay? So these lower mass, these are fragments. So when you're identifying an unknown, provided that the data is clean and off of a clean instrument, the highest number that you observe is most likely to represent your intact molecule where nothing has begun to break apart, okay? Um, as you start to see lower and lower numbers, you're most likely observing fragmentation. Okay, so um, when we look in the mass spec, there's a few other diagnostic um, identifiers that can be really helpful. Um, compounds that have one nitrogen or any odd number of nitrogen. So if you have one nitrogen or three nitrogen atoms, we're probably not gonna look at too many that have more nitrogen than that at this point. Um, they tend to have an odd mass number, okay? So again, we look far to the right because we're looking for the highest mass that most, lep most likely represents our intact molecule. And we see this signal here, 73, is an odd number. So I begin to see, okay, maybe there's a nitrogen here. In your case, if your solubility data or your IR has also indicated the presence of a nitrogen, this is a nice cohesive data set that's starting to add up in the right direction. Based on the number of unique carbons, you can now start to see if it makes sense to have X number of carbons plus one nitrogen. And if you start to account for the mass you're observing. Okay, so um, taking a look back at um, sort of recapping 
what we have discussed um, within this module. Um, within the mass spec, you're going to see, and let's consider the molecule pentane. Okay, so this is going to be our recap molecule. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, pentane has five carbons, a structure of C5H12. Here is the mass of pentane, shown here. Okay, remember that the most abundant signal we're going to see associated with pentane is going to come from 12 times 5, because that is the most abundant isotope of carbon, and then 12 times 1, because we always use 1 for hydrogen. That's how we get our 72. Okay, again, we call this major signal calculated by the most abundant isotope at each atom, the molecular ion, okay? So this represents the molecular ion of pentane. What we start to see, as we observed in the previous spectrum, is that below 72, we start to see fragmentation. And sometimes the fragmentation itself can be more abundant than what we actually observe for the intact molecule. Think of it as the scenario where those baseballs were hitting the glass window fast and hard. More of the molecule may have actually broken up into tiny pieces, um, and you may see more of the molecules as they approach the detector as these smaller fragments, okay? Um, when we see a scenario where one of the fragments has become higher in abundance or counts than the intact molecule itself, we call that signal the base peak, okay? Um, there's really no great way to predict if you're going to observe fragmented ions being taller than the intact molecule itself. Um, it, you just have to look at the data Again, you see your highest mass for these unknowns. That's the one you're gonna to try to match to the molecules in your list of possibilities. Um, what you can do in hindsight, however, is you could try to make sense of the fragments. Like, does it make sense that the molecule would have split here? Does it leave a particularly stable ion if I break that bond? Is that a particularly weak bond? Um, again, that'll probably go out a little bit outside the scope of this particular class, um, but people can really dig into that information to sort of validate structural features. Okay, so that's everything you need to know about mass spectrometry. We're gonna use this um, with your particular unknown, so every set of student will get the opportunity to really look at two pieces of mass spectra data and really analyze it in thorough. Um, I have a soft spot for mass spectrometry. I did a lot of work identifying proteins through mass spec. Um, another really popular application of mass spectrometry nowadays is in the field of metabolomics and in biomarker discovery. Um, a beauty of mass spec is it can diagnose or detect very low concentration of molecules. So some of the protein work we did was at picomolar concentrations. You wouldn't be able to see it. It would be hard to take an NMR of it, um, but the mass spec can confirm its presence. Um, so this is a cool study that I had found. Um, some researchers were looking at um, nuts that are common in Southeast Asia, believed to be um, both have medicinally beneficial properties, but also to be associated with oral cancers. Uh, one of the active ingredients in these nuts is shown here, and it actually um, has a lot in common with your neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and that's where some of its um, effects are thought to come from. And um, what these researchers were interested in doing is understanding how this active ingredient was metabolized. Um, so they were able to look at two populations of mice, ones that had ingested the nut and ones that hadn't. And they were able to compare the metabolites in their bloodstream. And from, um, from the mice that had ingested this nut, 
um, they were able to identify all of these downstream degradation products um, that they believe came from the body's manipulation of this active ingredient. Um, I think it's a really powerful example of how mass spectrometry can give us a lot of insight into biochemistry. And um, there's a lot of cool research going on in this field. So it's a great technology to be mindful of. If you continue on to research that's integrated with biology, it's certainly one you're likely to use again.